Coming up next on Another View, President Abraham Lincoln. The new Steven Spielberg movie, Lincoln, promises to be a big hit with Virginia front and center of its production. But why all the interest in the 16th president? What does his presidency mean in light of the upcoming 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation? I'm Barbara Ham Lee. My guest today will talk about Virginia's role in the making of the movie, and we'll have a conversation with President Lincoln. Yes, really. Plus, we'll take your calls. Another view is next right after this news from NPR. Discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African American community. This is Another View. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. Before we get started with our show today, I want to give a huge shout out to Norview High School, Dr. Steely, Steely the uh, principal over at Norview, and all the students and staff. Norview was named one of 10 breakthrough schools in the United States for outstanding efforts and improving student achievement. And that award came through the 2013 MetLife Foundation National Association of Secondary School principals, breakthrough schools program. And Dr. King says that um, Norview High School has used proven research-based strategies to ensure that all students will be successful. And we are exceptionally proud of Norview, and we hope to replicate their successes across the division. We hope they do too. Congratulations to Norview High School. Now, the movie Lincoln opens in theaters nationwide tonight. It's the story of our 16th president, and it was shot entirely in Virginia, Richmond and Petersburg and surrounding areas, to be exact. Now, whenever Steven Spielberg is involved, the movie is epic, and it certainly has created quite a bit of buzz. During this hour, we're going to talk about the movie, the history. We're going to find out about a program that you really want to know about, and we're going to have a conversation with Mr. Lincoln. But but first, please welcome to another view, Joel Rubin. He is president of Rubin Communications Group and the Virginia Beach Forum. Hi, Joel. Barbara, wonderful to be with you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Jeff Frizzell with the Hampton Roads Film Office. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Barbara. Thanks for having and, me. And, and an actor <clears throat> inside the movie. Do you know, did you make it? I don't know. I'll find out tonight. <laughs> and Rita McClenney, who is president and CEO of Virginia Tourism Corporation. Hi, Rita. How are you? Hi, this is the dinner and a movie weekend. Lincoln's <laughs> rolling out. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, before we get into the conversation, let's listen to a clip from the movie. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. We can't tell our people they can vote yes on abolishing slavery unless at the same time we can tell them that you're seeking a negotiated peace. It's either the amendment or this Confederate peace. You cannot have both. How many hundreds of thousands have died during your administration? Congress must never declare equal those whom God created unequal. Leave the Constitution alone. We are stepped out upon the world stage now with the fate of human dignity in our hands. Blood's been spilled to afford us this moment. Now, now, now. Wow, that's just going to be so powerful if you've seen the trailer of the movie. So, Rita, how does this work? Did Steven Spielberg have his people call your people? How does that happen? <laughs> the film, 10 years in the making this year, and... Stephen was in Virginia on another project, War of the Worlds, which filmed in Lexington, Virginia, Rockbridge County area. And looking at the rolling hills of Virginia, he said, wow, this would be a perfect backdrop for my next film about Abraham Lincoln. And little did we know, it would be another 10 years before this film would be coming out in theaters. But that's how it all started. And then Rick Carter, Stephen's longtime production designer, came back for a few visits to look at locations, and they were writing the screenplay, 
And the screenplay really went through a metamorphosis. The film is based on Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, mm-hmm. Team of Rivals, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln. But what Tony Kushner, the writer, did is sort of depart at emancipation, and that is the result of the final screenplay and what everyone will see on the screen. So he really focuses on what was going on at that time as they were um, implementing the Emancipation Proclamation and or not. Yes, or the Thirteenth Amendment. Pres- okay. President Lincoln's vision of having an amendment to the Constitution, and that okay. would be what it would would be required to abolish slavery. But also, the going tendential to that was how do we stop the Civil War? in its track. Okay. So this movie brought a lot of income to the state of Virginia, did it not? Yeah, the economic impact of the film was $64 million. The direct spend in Virginia, $32 million. But, you know, while they're here, they shop, they go to tourist attractions, they, you know, bring their families in for the weekend. You know, they do lots of things in and around the, beyond the direct spin of the movie. Mm-hmm. So are you in the movie, Rita? No, I'm not. No. <laughs> Believe me, there was enough going on behind the scenes. There was hardly time to get all of that done and certainly um, being in front of the camera. That's not my thing anyway. So. <laughs> so, but this was shot in 2011. How long were they in the Richmond, Petersburg area? And how much disruption, if four, any? Four months uh, in the Richmond, Petersburg, Hanover County, Goochland area. So Richmond plays the U.S. Capitol, plays Washington, D.C. Petersburg plays Richmond in the film. And it wasn't really disruptive because they transform Capitol Square into their back lot. And it was open to the public. So it was a symphony of movie production and people going about their daily business. Uh, for four months. Wow. So the state of Virginia, your your job and, and the film office job is to continue to bring in movies to Virginia as this is yes. a, a part of our economic development, yes? Yes. Our mission is to recruit film production from outside of Virginia, but also to foster cooperation with in-state filmmakers and production companies. So the economic impact of film across Virginia it's three hundred and ninety four million. It was for two thousand and eleven. And that's a fourteen and a half percent increase over two thousand and ten. And a big part of the increase was due to two films. The Have and the Whole, which is not in theaters yet, and the Lincoln film. Mm-hmm. Any um any movies you can tell us about that are upcoming? Yeah, we had a film that just wrapped last week in fact. It's based on a novel by David Baldacci titled Wish You Well. They filmed in Giles County, which is southwest Virginia, and in and around the town of Parisburg. In fact, some of the locations they used were same, the same locations used in Dirty Dancing. And we have a couple of other hot projects that are close to announcing, uh, but they're not quite ready yet. But it's been a really great two years, and we, the future is very bright for production. You know, we have New Dominion Pictures in Suffolk, and they just wrapped up on the fifth season of A Haunting. Mm-hmm. And there are many fine production companies there in the Hampton Roads area that are, you know, very busy. And wonderful students come out of Regent University in terms of, you know, talent for writing and production. And so, really, production is on the uptick in Virginia. And we have so many fine universities that now have creative writing and um, also gaming uh, degrees, like George Mason. You can get a degree in creating uh, video games. Mm-hmm. And so all of these are just the new technologies are, are are where future careers are. And entertainment and film production is set to grow at about 6.2%. That's fantastic. Or annually. Well, you know what, Rita? We know that you're coming to Hampton Roads on the 28th to the Virginia Beach Forum for this uh, huge event that we're going to have Joel tell us about in just a moment. But we want to um, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I know your schedule is packed, so I'm going to let you go. But we look forward to seeing you on the 28th. And thanks so much for being with us here at Another View. Thank you, Barbara, and I look forward to being there. It'll be a great evening. Okay, take care. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Okay, Okay, so Jeff, you were an actor in the movie. 
Tell us about it. <laughs> well, I'm not an actor. I'm normally a behind-the-camera guy, but I do an occasional acting job. And uh, I had grown my hair and beard for another role, and the casting call came out for Lincoln, and it said they were looking for guys between the ages of 20 and I think 35 was the number, with longer hair, thinner builds, you know, beards, you know, and I'm 53, so let's not kid anybody. I was going to say, <laughs> They were looking for him to play basically soldiers. Right. But I thought to myself, well, you, you need a colonel, you need a general, so <laughs> I'm going to send true. my headshot in anyway. I've grown this hair out, I've grown this beard out, I'm going to just send it in. And I got a call, and they asked me to come up, and so I came up, and, you know, they look at you and see your look and figure you're out and decide whether they want you, and then they give you a call back, and I got the call back, and what they did was Lincoln came from D.C. by steamboat into Richmond, you know, the famous deal where he sits at Jefferson Davis's desk after, you know, the Confederacy had fled Richmond, mm -hmm. um, and so there was a a dock scene and this was actually a set that was originally built for the john adams miniseries they created the boston wharf on the uh james county farm the prison up there mm -hmm. and uh there was already a three master schooner in these dock buildings and all this great stuff and so then they built a replica 160 foot steamboat paddle wheel that ran in the steam. I mean, it was wow. it was unbelievable um <clears throat> and so they needed dock workers guys you know hauling you know bales of stuff mm-hmm and so, you know, so I got that part. We came up there, and it was about 20 of us that were extras. And they started dressing us, and they put the coolest boots on me I've ever seen. And then the greatest <laughs> pants. And then this amazing shirt and these amazing suspenders. And the guy looks at me, and, well, first the pants wouldn't fit in the boots. And so the boots got covered up. Then he's like, well, let's put something else on. He put this basically old-style sweatshirt on me that covered up the great shirt and the suspenders. So I had to lose those. Well, next thing you know, I've got an apron on that comes from my neck all the way down to my ankles. And I don't look like anybody else is going out there, right? And people are kind of laughing at me. What, are you supposed to be a butcher? Or are you this? Or are you that? And so we go out there, and there's about 20 of us in line, and the guy's coming up. And I'm about the 14th, 15th one in line. And they're like, okay, you two come with me. You two come with me. You two come with me. He gets to me. He's like, oh, uh, yeah. And then goes to the next two. You two come with me. You two come with me. I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know what? What's going on here? And these guys are all laughing at me. Well, there were 20 guys that were working in the dock in the background. But this town had one blacksmith, and that was me. Oh. And it was a day that it was 32 degrees, wind chill of about 28, and I've got a fire. And I'm sweating while everybody else is freezing. <laughs> and they're all having to move crates in the background every time. And I'm just pumping this thing and hitting the steel. And, uh, I, you know, I was probably in about, you know, what they filmed, three or four scenes that I think, you know, that's pretty close up. And the best part was I was sitting there on my little box, and Spielberg came over and sat next to me. And... You know, I was kind of looking at my little blacksmith area, and, you know, I don't know, it was pretty cool. Did so you get a chance I'm, I'm to talk to make it. Uh, no, you, you know, it's kind of one of those speak when spoken to. You know, it's a kind of unwritten rule on set, and you don't mm -hmm. want to get, you know, guys are busy, and uh, you don't want to disturb them. But really, probably the funniest thing, picture-wise, was Daniel Day-Lewis is 6'3", with a stovepipe paddle makes him 6'8". Well, Spielberg is 5'8". And to see them stand next to one another was just the greatest picture but it was fun there wow. was three four five hundred i don't know how many extras were there that day it was it was an incredible experience so when and you did not have a speaking part in this no. though you, you were just hammering yep. hammering away so when you go see it have you seen the movie yet I, i'm going tonight um got a group of friends 12 of us are going so uh if i'm in it i'll be signing autographs out front of the commodore <laughs> theater if not i'll be sneaking out the back door <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Joel, there is a huge program that you have going on in Virginia Beach on November the 28th, which is uh, a part of the Virginia Beach Forum. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, I'm the president of the Virginia Beach Forum, which is in its 17th year, and typically we bring speakers in like the Norfolk Forum does, the Virginia Beach Forum does, but uh, we decided this year we're going to do things a little bit differently, and I told the board, I said, look, the Lincoln movie is going to be here Christmas time. Why don't we do a program about Lincoln? Uh, because, you know, Lincoln had a history in Hampton Roads. He came here twice during the Civil War. John mm -hmm. Corstein, who I think you know mm -hmm. very well, very well. Uh, knows all about that. And he'll be on our stage on November 28th talking about uh, Lincoln's history in Hampton Roads. But before we get to that, 
in the program. You know, the clip you just played was from the Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have an eight-year-old boy named Lincoln Keel. His name is Lincoln. His parents wow. named him Lincoln, and he embraced his name. And he, he, has, he knows the Gettysburg Address by heart. He's got a little Lincoln outfit he does. So when you sit down there at the Sandler Center on November 28th, you can see this little kid come out there and do the Gettysburg Address. And then when he's done, your next guest, Jim Getty, who is one of the top Lincoln impersonators in the country, will come on stage, probably pat him on the head and say, move on, kid. <laughs> and he's going to talk about, you know, in Lincoln's voice and in Lincoln's character, uh, about this sort of evolution, uh, Lincoln's evolution on the issue of slavery, which mm -hmm. really is uh, all part and parcel of this this film. You know, Lincoln wanted to preserve the Union. That's what it all was about to him. And he, he would have kept slavery in place if it could have preserved the Union. But he, as he evolved over those four or five years of the war, he began to see, one, that slavery had to end. That's why he did the Emancipation Proclamation 150 years ago this year, 1862. Yes, and, and we're actually going to be talking with, with Jim Getty in, right. in our next segment um, because I do want to ask him about that that whole perspective because, you know, when when I was coming through school, you know, I know it was 100 years ago, yeah. but there was a very different way that, that the uh, the whole Emancipation Proclamation was taught and, sure. and the reason behind why Lincoln did. So I'm and, looking forward and it was to that first, discussion. And one of the first times was ever read was under the Emancipation Oak over in Hampton, Hampton, Hampton University. University. Yes. So uh, Hampton and Hampton Roads uh, and the the contraband slaves, which which John Corstein mm -hmm. will talk about, all fits into this narrative of how we got from the beginning of the war to the Emancipation Proclamation to the 13th Amendment, which is the subject of this movie. Mm -hmm. And this movie is not a war movie. This movie is about politics. It's about the characters. It's about uh, the, the people. Lincoln focuses, this is from the review done by the uh, Tribune, Lincoln focuses on what it took to the, get the 13th Amendment passed and the multifarious players involved either in its blockage or its passage. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a really an adult movie if you're really interested in politics. It's a great screenplay based somewhat on Doris Kern Goodwin book, mm -hmm. uh, but it really gets into these characters. Now, have you seen the movie? I'm going to be in the same theater with him to tonight, with Jeff tonight. <laughs> You're to, part of the 12. <laughs> to, to go see it. But Rita McClenney, who you just had on, she mm -hmm. will be there on November 28th talking about how the movie was made. Jeff and a number of other extras who are in the movie will be there uh, as well, including Judy Flowers, who was the costumer to many of the people in the movie. And then our finale is going to be the singing of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And the choir is going to be from New Oak Grove Baptist Church, which is an African-American church in Blackwater section of Virginia Beach. Uh, Reverend Tyrone Johnson, great guy. And they're going to have 25 or so members of the choir there singing. Bob McDonald's daughter, Janine's going to be doing one of the verses. Uh, Elizabeth Hughes, John Cosgrove, and Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Getty, who's a baritone, he'll be singing as, as well. So there's something there for everyone that night. So this is really a family affair oh, that you it, want people it, to it come It is out truly to. a community event. Um, you know, we're going to have an eight-year-old and a nine-year-old up there on mm -hmm. stage. We're going to have a church choir. Uh, we're going to have John Corstein, an historian. I mean, everybody's local except for Rita McClenney, who's coming in from Richmond to talk about what happened during the making of the film, and then uh, Jim Getty, our Lincoln impersonator. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. I would really love to hear from some other extras, um, people who may have participated in the making of the movie, particularly if you are African-American, because as I was talking to um, the guests, we're just trying to find... a. Um, uh, Many people from the community who lent themselves, their acting abilities, their time, talents to the movie. Jeff, it takes a lot more than just actors in terms of making making any movie. Oh. Um, in terms of how, how it touches the community. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other things that happen? Well, sure. I mean, it's... Even in just the food preparation alone, the day I was there, you know, they fed 500 people in an hour. I've, I've never seen anything like it. It's just a well-oiled machine. But we had people locally, you know, who are, again, costume designers like Judy Flowers. Uh, mm -hmm. Mia Zantoni is a wardrobe person who actually wardrobed me. She's from this area. Um, people who are construction people, set designers, set dressers. Paul Schultz, he's a construction guy. He was up there working on set. Uh, a lot of grip and electrics from this area were, were on set. I, 
I'm not for sure what the actual number of jobs were, but there were a ton of guys from Hampton Roads, guys and gals from Hampton Roads that went up there. And, I read and a, an, ar- an article, and I think it was in the pilot, where, they, where one woman was talking about how she needed to, she had to darn the socks yes. for for uh, for President Lincoln, mm-hmm. and um, and so they, I mean, it, it, it's everything from seamstresses to it, it to, is, and that dry was, cleaners. That was actually to- <laughs> Judy Flowers who he was talking okay, about. One yeah. of the things I read, which I found really amazing, was that Daniel Day Lewis to get into character, you know. So they, the, one of the things he had on him the night he was assassinated was a embroidered handkerchief that his wife had done, and that was not part of the movie. But they embroidered that handkerchief, and he carried it in his pocket the whole time. Wow! So I mean, that's Ju- that's amazing. Judy okay. Flowers is going to be on the stage in a Mary Todd Lincoln-like <laughs> dress, and Elizabeth Hughes, my little nine-year-old girl, who's going to be singing the first and last verse of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. They've dressed her in a period costume uh, as well. So. And we're going to have two other Lincoln impersonators out in the foyer when you come in. We're going to have a band that plays period uh, music when you mm-hmm. when you come in. So you're really going to get engulfed into the ear. This is at the Sandler Center, by the way, in Virginia Beach uh, for the Virginia Beach Forum on November 28th. And I know tickets are available. How do people get tickets if they the want to The best go? thing to do to, to save the most money, go to the Sandler Center ticket office. You save on all the fees. But we've discounted the tickets tremendously. There's a special rate for students. It's very affordable. Adult rate's very uh, affordable. You can go to sandlercenter.org. If you want to buy the tickets online, if you want to save money on the fees, go directly to the Sandler Center mm-hmm. ticket office in Virginia Beach and Town Center and get your tickets uh, there. So for, for those of, um, who are listening who may not be familiar with the Virginia Beach Forum um, and may not understand why this is such a departure for you all, can you talk a little bit about what the Forum normally does, if you will, and how this is a bit different? Well, like last year, we had Howard Feynman, who's a political pundit, came and spoke. We had Mia Farrow, an actress, came and spoke. I think we had David Baldacci, I think is who we had last year, who's a, mm-hmm. a writer. Uh, whose movie is being produced in, in Virginia. So, you know, we typically bring in a speaker, like the Norfolk Forum was bringing in uh, Robert Gates and George Will, and actually Diane, I mean, um, Bar- Doris Kearns Goodwin's coming in in April mm-hmm. uh, as well. So uh, that's typically how these forums uh, work. But I said, you know something, we, we need to create not just people want to be people want more interactive programming today so this year we're starting off with this lincoln program and it's gonna be one thing after another changing things on on the stage we are going to have a speaker john stossel coming in uh, january on the uh, 17th but then we get back into an event on march 13th we're going to do a political talk show on the stage with larry sabato who you mm-hmm. know from uva yes. and vivian page who i know you yes. know very well will <laughs> be up there the with show. me and tony yes. mccraney from wnis uh, and and others. So we're gonna we're gonna sort of have a Bill Maher type show on the stage that night. It's gonna be a, a lot of <laughs> that should fun. be a lot of fun. Uh, whatever the politics are of the day, but that's March thirteenth. And you can go to Virginia Beach VA Beach Forum dot com, and you can buy the whole season. You can become a sponsor if you're a company and get get your tickets, or you can buy tickets individually for each of the events. Oh, okay, Jeff. One last question because I know that you're gonna have to go soon, also. But if someone listening to you and they say, you know, that's pretty cool. I'd like to do that the next time a movie comes through how do they find out what well to do? as far as extras we have several casting you know companies in the area one that just does extra casting um or you can look on the fil- our film office website which is uh film org okay and Roads dot org yep okay and you know, send an email in, say you're interested in this. The film offices normally don't work with actors as much as they work with the production crews and the logistics of getting mm-hmm. the people in here and them spending that money so Rita for instance, was talking if you, about. So, if you did carpentry work, as mm-hmm. an example, yes. um, you could contact the film office Correct. to say, I might be available Correct, to, uh, and we would put you in that. our directory and keep you on our list, and when people call looking for those type of people, we give them the names of the people we have. Okay. That's Jeff Rizal with the Hampton Roads Film Office, and if you go see the movie movie Lincoln, look for the blacksmith exactly. <laughs> in the movie. Thanks so much, Jeff, for being Thank with you. us. We really appreciate it. And when we come back, we're going to have a conversation with the 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. We'll be right back. Abraham Lincoln has asked us to work with him to accomplish the death of slavery. No one's ever been loved so much by the people. Don't waste that power. This fight is for the United States of America. Do we choose to be born, or we fit it to the times we're born into? Well, I don't know about myself, 
You may be. This settles the fate for all coming time. Not only of the millions now in bondage, but of unborn millions to come. Shall we stop this bleeding? Another clip from the movie Lincoln. So the film is one thing, but what about the real history? Did Lincoln free the slaves because he was a benevolent man, as I was taught in elementary school? Or was the Emancipation Proclamation driven by the desire to reunite the country? President Abraham Lincoln joins me now through the interpretation of historian Jim Getty. Hello, Mr. President. How are you? Well, I thank you, Pine. I'm uh, talking to you on a bright, sunny day, yes. I'm glad it's sunny where you are. It's a little bit cloudy here <laughs> we, uh, where we are. But, you know, I guess my first question to you, Mr. President, is why was it taught, or, or were you being benevolent by freeing the slaves? I don't know where to start here except to say that I'd always felt, growing up on the frontier, and my father and mother felt the same way, uh, that slavery was horrible. It was a cancer on a democratic body. But it was protected where it was in southern states by none less than our Constitution. So I had to look at that and say what felt in your heart and what you know in your mind, your head, uh, uh, don't always coincide. But we did see an opportunity to get rid of it. Well, that wasn't a very popular decision. Oh, no. And there were so many people in the uh, in the northern states who felt uh, like the abolitionists up in New England, who felt certainly slavery is wrong, but not all abolitionists felt that there was an equality within the race. So all of these things had to figure into the uh, the mix, so to say, as I approached the presidency. But I had made my my peace with that earlier when in 1854. And they tried to extend slavery into the Northwest Territories beyond the Mississippi River. I came out of my law office. I wasn't running for anything. And I spoke then about don't be complacent, Northerners. Don't let this expansion happen. And when I did that, I, uh, I began to get the wrath of Southern states. So tell me, how you, what, where were you in terms of making the decision that the abolition of slavery needed to be a part of the condition to bring the country back together? Well, How did you get there? Yes, you know Charles Sumner is the abolitionist Massachusetts senator, a good friend of mine, mm-hmm. um, and Horace Greeley, and certainly Frederick Douglass. These people were all pushing me from the beginning, from the firing on Fort Sumner the time to free the slaves. And again, I refer back to the Constitution, and I said, I know slavery is the cause of this war, but we have a Constitution. We're trying to protect a form of government called democracy. We must stay with that Constitution, and therefore, I couldn't. The the Supreme Court would not allow it. But by 1862, I was aware public opinion had uh, been forthcoming that slavery was the cause of the war. And how could you end a war successfully, leaving the cause of it still in place? So I began to have a different uh, interpretation of what my responsibility and the the executive uh, was to do. You know, Mr. Lincoln, I, I understand that uh, you invited Frederick Douglass to the White House, and that was a, um, a big deal because um, now, as we call them African-Americans today, we're not allowed or we're not invited to the White House unless they were in a slave role. Oh, well, uh, that's true. And, and I, I want your public to know that Frederick and I had met several times. But when I really called him to the White House, I was quite concerned. We had passed the Emancipation Proclamation. And in 1864, I wanted the world to see that this government by the people I had spoken of in Gettysburg a year before, Mm -hmm. now in the time of a national election, could have that national election. The South wasn't going to have. They had a constitution that called for a presidential term of six years. But I wanted the world to see that we could have that. But when 
The Democrats held their convention in Chicago. They nominated George B. McClellan to run against me. Mm -hmm. And they had enough peace at any price members to get a plank in the platform that said, if you elect us on Inauguration Day, this war stops. Now, a lot of war-weary people in the North were all for that. But it also meant slavery would be reinstated. So I urgently, I think it was in August, when it didn't look like I could possibly be reelected, I called Frederick to the White House, and I said, you've got to have an antenna that moves into the South to tell your people, now's the time to use that Underground Railroad to get out of where they are, where they'll be locked into slavery for their, their lifetime. Because for the most part, they did not know about their freedom. Well, they, they didn't. There was a lot of delay in that, too. Uh, you're, you're going back to the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's right. Yes. yes. Sure, yes. there was. And certainly the slave owners didn't want them to know that. You know. <laughs> well, you know, you you started out as such a humble man. You, you um, were literally raised in the log cabin. Um, how did you rise all the way to the presidency? Did you foresee that in yourself as a young child? Oh, never, never, never. And I think uh, you respond to conditions, and uh, when I moved to Illinois with my parents and then set out on my own, my father and my stepmother and my mother had died in Indiana, and because in New Salem I had some education, the men and only white males could vote, uh, Mm -hmm. asked me if I would run for the legislature to uh, better uh, represent them. So I was called into politics, uh, you might say, because of my education. And it just went on from there. And when you get a cause like slavery, and if it hadn't been for slavery, I never would have been president. There would have been nothing to draw me out of my lucrative, and I say lucrative for a poor boy. I, I was making pretty good money in, in my law practice. I would have, uh, I would have never pursued the presidency, uh, except I wanted to put a foot down firmly and say, I know it's legal constitutionally, but we can't. Let it expand. You know, be, and and um, I have another guest here with me, Mr. President. Um, his name is Joel Rubin. Um, and I'm going to let him ask you a question in just a second. But when you were in private conversations with other legislators, with your friends, um, with family members, and you and the topic of slavery came about, what would they say? And, and how much did you have to push back to convince them that that getting rid of slavery was a good thing? Well, not my family, but my uh, certainly my by the people that I dealt with in the legislature. They were very convinced that uh, no, uh, and basically upon the race thing, they uh, they said this can't happen, and uh, so I had to uh, to argue one on one or in small groups uh, as well as speak to the public about it. So I, it was constantly on my mind, especially from 1862. And that's why uh, I understand uh, you're going to have a new media production out that talks about how I worked with hesitant congressmen between the 1864 election and the uh, the uh, swearing in of the of the new Congress to get that 13th Amendment on the on the books, so that if they threw out the Emancipation Proclamation, which was a, purely a, strictly a, a war necessity, uh, that uh, that we would not depend upon the Emancipation Proclamation anymore, we would have circumvented that and gone to the 13th Amendment. So there were constant arguments. Some of them uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty violent. Pretty violent. Joel, Barbara, uh, mm-hmm. Mr. President, uh, yes, sir. great to talk to you. Uh, Barbara was asking how you rose to become President of the United States, and there's no question you had very humble beginnings. I mean, you were wrapped in animal skins when you were born lying on a dirt floor. So, I mean, you came from from deep poverty. And, um, you know, our president right now had only been in the U.S. Senate for two years before he became president of the United States, Barack Obama. And people said he wasn't qualified, experienced enough to be president. Well, you had only been in the House of Representatives for two years, and you were only elected with 37 percent of the pop of the a popular oh, yeah. vote back in in 1860. And uh, and so tell us how you you knew you had to sort of marshal the entire government, the entire country at the time for this war effort. Uh, when you started, I understand, in 1860, there were like 16,000 men in the 
army by, I think, within a year or so, there were half a million. So, I mean, the extraordinary talents or the extraordinary feats of having to gather all of this power and to put bring a nation to war. Tell us how a, a humble man like you was able to pull that off. Well, you know, you, you, you mentioned my two years in the U.S. House. I had had eight years in the Illinois State Legislature. Uh, I had some political savvy, and I was always reading everything, you know, connected with books. I loved history. I loved to read about the Revolution and all of these things, and what we have been handed down by our founding fathers and what debt we owed to them. But, uh, no, I, I, I pursued a, a plan that, uh, that said uh, there need not be a war. We can settle this by negotiation. But Fort Sumter was fired on, and then we called those troops. And as you say, we had about 16,000. Many of them spread out all over the country, and one out of three would go into a gray uniform. So we had to rely on the states calling their militia. And there was so much enthusiasm that the camps were overflowing. Uh, we couldn't provide them hardly with food and equipment, uh, uniforms. And uh, it, w- it was a, a, a tremendous recall of, of troops. We had, had never had that large of army, I was told, in the Mexican War. Mm-hmm. So some of our generals didn't know how to handle these men, uh, never had had such a, a core at their uh, disposal, and, and, and also there were just unbelievable problems at the beginning. And you had personal problems. I mean, you had a son that died in 1862, Willie. Yes, and I had one die back in Illinois at age four, and one died at the White House. Willie died at <laughs> age 11. Uh, that's the one people I think remember the most. But uh, uh, medicine then uh, uh, must not have been what you know now. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, they uh, they did not recover from typhoid fever and uh, diphtheria. So before you know, I want to ask you about your wife and about your your personal life in just a moment. But I do have this question: um, outside of Frederick Douglass, um, what other um, slaves did you interact with? Well, did Sojourner you have Truth, uh, Sojourner Truth came to me at the White House. We uh, had a, a personal interview. Uh, there were several of them, and. Uh, I did not meet Harriet Tubman. I heard about her, but I and her heroism, but I, I never got to meet her. But uh, certainly, uh, uh, I uh, I was fresh on uh, meeting with the uh, the black troops. I uh, um, the, what we called the colored troops at that time, and uh, these were always uh, uh, things that uh, bothered me so much because they knew. That the South had put out an edict that says, don't send colored troops down here. If our slaves see them in uniform with the sunlight glaring on their bayonets, they're likely to rise up and mutiny and kill their owners so they can follow that army north. So we're telling you, Mr. President, don't send a black man down here in uniform. If we capture him, he goes right to prison, uh, not to prison, but to the depths of the Gulf where he'll be locked into slavery forever and you'll never see him again or he'll go to the firing squad. So it was Frederick Douglass that made me see the light of using those men, but I had resisted that, but I I knew what uh, what they must be thinking and uh, as they marched in those uniforms. But, uh, in the in the quiet times because I understand Mr. President that you suffered from um from depression. Um and so in your quiet times, you know, how did you ground yourself so that you could continue to make these decisions? Well, I did have times of up and down that had been following me all my life. You grew up on the frontier where infant mortality is so prevalent and uh, some people have said maybe it was our diet out there that promoted these things. Many people had uh, melancholy. Uh, I just hope that when it's all over and people go ahead and write their books, that they don't exaggerate some of these things. Uh, mm. I, uh, I, I had moments of depression, but I could always function. And uh, I think some of the authors of later books try to make it seem that I wasn't able to get out of bed some days, but that's far from the truth. And uh, uh, I, I just, uh, I, don't, I don't want things over-exaggerated that uh, would say that I wasn't up to the job, because mm-hmm. I always felt that uh, 
in the darkest of times, you had to be the leader. When the men came home from Fredericksburg, Virginia, in December of 62, after a terrible defeat, and I met them at the 7th Street Wharf, and as they walked off to the hospitals, I said, it wasn't your fault. It was the leader's fault. We're going to get those leaders changed. So even in the darkest times, you have to give forth the leadership potential that you can see the light at the end of the tunnel. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Give us a call if you have a question for the 16th President of the United States, Mr. Abraham Lincoln. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Mr. Lincoln, we have this thing today that's called Facebook. And it is a social media. Um, I don't even know how to explain it to you because then we'd have to talk about computers and everything else. But I have a question. I have a question for you from our Facebook page. And they want to, the uh, person wants to know what started the nickname Honest Abe. Do you know? Well, Honest Abe was put on me at the, uh, at the uh, Republican convention in 1860. When the committee woke up the day after they nominated me and said, oh, my gosh, we've got a, an Illinois lawyer. He's not known out east at all. We need to get a, a real name like Tippy Canoe and Tyler, too, at work. <laughs> so they knew that as a lawyer, I had always met with my client on the first day and said, now, if you can settle this case outside of court, you're going to save my fee. Most lawyers wouldn't do that. Ah. So they put honest on me, and Abe, of course, was short for Abraham. Absolutely. They also called him log splitter. <laughs> the rail splitter. The rail yes. splitter. Rail splitter. Rail splitter. You know, we me. would cut down trees to build split rail fences, and you would try to get a 16-foot length of trunk, and then with mallets and a sledge, you'd, you'd split it in two the long way, and then the half into quarters and the quarters into eighths, and you would have eight rails. And they said that with the twist of my wrist being just right as it hit the mallet, I could split them faster than anyone else, so they called me the rail splitter. Also. He was well, buff. <laughs> he was buff. Really, he was. Mr. President, I know um, that we only have a short amount of time left, and I really would like to speak with Jim Getty, who um, who is a historian who continues to help you live on in today's world. <laughs> but I have one last question before I let you go, and that okay. is, um, in, in 2012, where we are now, we have an African-American president. Are you surprised? Well, I'm not in, a, in, in most ways because as we come back to Frederick Douglass in his argument with me, you know that the African slave trade was entered in 1808. These men, and he was pushing for black men to go into the service, and I was dragging my feet for the reason I told you earlier. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, these men weren't born in Africa. He said they were born here. They don't want to call Africa home. They want to call America home. And you let them fight, Mr. President, and they will show others that they deserve the right of citizenship. And with that, of course, comes the right to vote. So if you can vote as uh, an African-American, you can certainly run for office. So I knew it wasn't going to happen overnight, none of that. Even when we promoted using black troops, giving them the franchise in 1864 for that election, many of the Congress were... Uh, you know, they just wouldn't believe that. They wouldn't. They wouldn't go along with it. Wow, I'm trying to see, Mr. President. Um, I thought we might have a phone call for you, but I guess we don't. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say goodbye to you, sir, and I'm going to ask Mr. Getty to uh, spend a little bit of time with us. Sure. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so well, much. I thank you. I thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Getty is a historian and um, interpreter of uh, Abraham Lincoln. He's located in Gettysburg. Jim, uh, how did you get into this? I was a uh, music major in college and was teaching high school choral music in Sandusky, Ohio in the early 70s when I grew a beard and people started commenting about the Lincoln-esque look. Uh, Hal Holbrook was doing Mark Twain at the time as a one-man show. And I had some theater background. I thought maybe I could do something, you know, to moonlight with it. And I just got all connected and uh, in-depth in research and so on. And convinced my wife that we should move to Gettysburg and start a little theater. So we've been here since uh, 1978. So you're going to be joining us here in um, Virginia Beach oh, on November the 28th? Looking forward to that. Well, I was, and I was referred to him by, by a number of people who said, if you want to get a great reenactor, uh, call Jim Getty. And I got in touch with, with, with Jim, and, and uh, I was 
thrilled that you had him on today so I could hear him myself because he'll be on stage uh, in 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 full Lincoln uh, get up and, and making a presentation making about some of these mm-hmm. issues that we've been talking about today. Um, Jim, what we've got about two minutes left, but what is the most misunderstood thing about Abraham Lincoln? In your opinion? Well, just that, you know, he he, uh, he stumbled along and into this. No, he was very calculated. He was, uh, he, the word today would be cool. He was prepared. He, uh, he he was knowledgeable. He was ready at the right time. Uh, but he was not the country bumpkin lawyer that a lot of people have earlier thought. He was very astute and... Uh, Intensely political, too. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's sure. what people learn from the movie. You know, in, in 1858, on November 19th, see, November 19th is the Gettysburg Address in 63, mm-hmm. but in 58, he had run against Stephen Douglas for the Senate and had lost, and the whole issue was slavery. Mm-hmm. And he wrote to a friend, he said, I'm glad I made the late race, it gave me a hearing on the great durable question of the age, which I could have had no other way, and though I now sink out of sight and shall be forgotten. I believe I have made some marks which will tell for the cause of civil liberty long after I am gone. So he was pre- he he had a premonition that that this was going to move things forward. I hate to cut you off, but we are out of time just about, and I want to give Joel one last opportunity to tell people where to come on November twenty eighth. Thank you, thank you. Uh huh. Yeah. Jim you, Getty, Jim. historian. We look forward to seeing you um, on November twenty eighth in Virginia Beach. You got ten seconds. He's going to make a couple school visits while he's here as well. <laughs> November twenty eighth is the Virginia Beach Forum. Lincoln, the man, the movie, the magic. We're not showing the movie. We'll have some clips, but we'll have Jim Getty, John Cor. The historian. We're going to be singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic with a black church choir. Go to sandlercenter.org if you want to buy tickets online, or go to the Sandler Center and buy your tickets there. You'll save a lot of money, and I'll see you on the 28th at the Sandler Center. Okay, and that's Joel Rubin, who is the president of the Virginia Beach Forum. Thank you so much for being here with me today, and we will be right back. And welcome back. Growing up, jazz legend John Coltrane's life was filled with music, but the talented saxophone player also faced hard times, sad times, and dark times. Coltrane's amazing journey is beautifully told and brilliantly illustrated in Gary Golio's latest work, a children's book titled Spirit Seeker, John Coltrane's Musical Journey. Our Lisa Godley spoke to the New York Times bestselling author about the path that took Coltrane from shy child to legendary musician. To hear him play, you think he was born with a saxophone in his hand, but John Coltrane didn't even pick up the sax until he started high school. It was a match made in heaven. He loved everything about it, from the clicking of the keys to the way the mouthpiece felt in his teeth. These are just a few of the details young readers will find as they turn the pages of Gary Golio's latest work, Spirit Seeker, John Coltrane's Musical Journey. After joining the high school band, John took his horn everywhere. Music made him happy and it seemed like what he was meant to do with his life. As he practiced for hours in the music room, his clear, warm notes floated through the school. Shy and quiet, he let the horn become his voice. Golio, a therapist and clinical social worker, has written several books about famous musicians. In Spirit Seeker, he walks us through Coltrane's struggles and triumphs. I asked him why he chose John Coltrane's story. I was interested because um, of what happened to him as a boy, how he lost First, his grandfather, who was kind of the head of the family in North Carolina. This was at Christmas time. And he lost his father a week later. And then, you know, a few months later, he lost his grandmother. And then, within another year, he lost his his uncle. And uh, similar things kind of happened to me when I was about his age that changed my life. (laughs) 
Golio hopes Coltrane's journey will touch lives, particularly young people dealing with challenging circumstances of their own. Coltrane used alcohol as a teen to cope with the pain of loss and loneliness, and later in life, drugs. One of the reasons I guess I write these books is because I feel like, uh, and the reason I love working with teenagers is because they're still willing to change. And they're still capable of hearing you and, and listening to something that that makes them want to change. The beautiful illustrations by Rudy Gutierrez draws readers into Spirit Seeker as Golio guides us through Coltrane's journey, working with greats like Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis, only to lose one job after another because of his addiction. Still, the sadness he'd known for years hung over him dark and heavy like an overcoat he couldn't take off. He even tried using drugs to take away his painful feelings, to quiet his thoughts and numb his body. But drugs couldn't do that, and John couldn't stop using them. He began falling asleep on stage or showing up late only to be fired. Part of him stood in the darkness while another part was searching for the light. It took Galeo just under two years to research and write Spirit Seeker, a story he hopes will not only inspire but give insight to young readers. Those things that are powerful and unpleasant that shape us, you know, whether it's the deaths of people we love or poverty or racism, whatever it might be. Uh, and in John's case, it was many of those things. Um, so, you know, I think kids need to know that uh, even their heroes have, you know, have gone through very difficult times. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And you can find Golio's book at any local bookstore. Time now for things to view and do in Hampton Roads. You will be my Saturday love. You're invited to participate in the Community Tech Fest at Campus Stella Elementary tomorrow, Saturday, November 17th from 1130 until 2 p.m. at Campus Stella Elementary in Norfolk. This is a continuing effort to promote digital literacy, broadband adoption, and technology for good throughout the city of Norfolk. There will be lots of hands-on fun activities that focus on science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM. It's free and open to the public, and WHRO is proud to be a participant. Visit anotherviewradio.org for more information. Tomorrow is the Feeding 5000 Thanksgiving Harvest and Community Celebration at the Farmer's Market, Jefferson Avenue in Newport News. It's from noon until 4 and open to the public. City officials, local politicians, and other leaders will serve as celebrity servers. Come join the celebration. Call 877-0792 for details. Pajama Jams and the Norfolk Chapter of Jack and Jill of America hosts PJs for the Holidays. It's a pajama drive to benefit children in need at the Boys and Girls Clubs of Southeast Virginia. They are collecting new pajamas from now until December 12th, and they need sizes 5T to adult large. There are several drop-off locations. Call 240-344-8929 to find a location near you. And check out Jan's Informants 2012, featuring Evan Garr and Stephen Richard on Friday Friday, November 23rd at 8 p.m. at the George Mason University Center for the Arts, University Drive in Fairfax. Call 1-888-945-2468 for ticket information. These and other events are on our website, anotherviewradio.org. If you'd like to share today's show with a friend, go to our website and download the podcast. It won't cost you a thing. Next week is Thanksgiving, and the Another View crew is taking some time off to be with family and friends. We wish you a safe and happy holiday. For producer Lisa Godley, audio engineer Perry Smith, Eric Moore, and Jordan Yowell on the phones, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We'll see you in two weeks for another view.